All right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Kellen as we start to have uh, people file in. I think we're probably going to have a little bit of a couple folks coming in a little bit later. But um, uh, first, I'll just go ahead and mention Kellen is here at Goddard. So um, I think Kellen is on site some days as well. So you can definitely go and say hi. Um, but beyond that, uh, Kellen's going to be talking today about the Lord of the Rings, understanding planet formation through imaging of planet forming disks on this particular episode of GSFC Exoplanet Seminar. Um, and he is a recent graduate from the University of Oklahoma, uh, where he worked on work with John Wisniewski to study circumstellar disks using uh, integral field spectroscopy. He started here as an MPP and currently works with Mike McElwain, Tyler Groff, and Josh Schleider. Uh, Schleider to study exoplanet systems using both brown and space-based high contrast imaging data. And he really focuses on developing and applying new post-processing and analysis techniques for direct imaging. So an emphasis kind of on PSF subtraction and modeling of a circumstellar uh, disk system. So Calvin, you can uh, feel free to add more to that and feel free to pick up from wherever you want to. Thanks. Sure, thanks so much. Uh, so let me share my screen here. Um, is that working? Looks great. Hopefully. Awesome. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you again for the introduction. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for, um, for being here. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, share some of my recent work um, on, uh, on this exciting topic with you. Um, so uh, my content today is drawn heavily from two recent publications. Um, Diversities, Lawson et al. 2022 and AppJ Letters, uh, and Curry et al. Uh, 2022 and Nature Astronomy. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out these papers if you're interested in sort of the full picture of these results. Um, but uh, my contributions to this project were uh, really possible uh, thanks to a huge list of collaborators. Um, in particular, my PhD advisor, uh, John Wisniewski, um, then Thing Curry at UTSA, uh, and then my postdoc advisors here at Goddard, um, Mike McElwain, Tyler Groff, and, and Josh Schleter. Um, so extra special thanks to, um, to all of you. Um, so uh, in general, I'd like to note that uh, this research deals with some intricate nuances of, of post-processing for high contrast imaging. Um, so I've tried to include sufficient background for uh, those outside of this uh, very uh, specific area. Um, however, if I've left out some detail that's leaving you confounded, um, please don't hesitate to interrupt me with any questions. Um, if you type something in the chat, I will almost definitely not see it, um, but really feel free to uh, just chime in um, if, if something's uh, eluding you. Um, so finally, before we get started, I'd like to give you a quick outline um, of what we'll be covering. Um, so first, I'll lay out some of the groundwork uh, for our efforts in direct imaging of, of planets and disks. Um, so this will include uh, putting the motivation for direct imaging studies in the context of sort of the bigger picture of exoplanetology. Um, then I'll introduce the technology at the core of these studies, uh, including some of the more recent advancements uh, and capabilities that they've provided. Um, the next I'll introduce the study of planet forming disks in particular uh, and discuss how current post-processing and analysis serves as a major limiting factor for these studies. Um, and so following this, um, I will introduce uh, a new class of post-processing algorithms uh, that we've been developing. Um, and I'll explain how, uh, sorry, um, so I'll uh, provide some validation of, of these techniques using simulated data. Um, and then I will uh, demonstrate application uh, in the imaging discovery of a deeply embedded protoplanet. Um, so this is featured in Curry Lawson et al. 2022. Um, and subsequently, I'll um, give you some demonstrations of uh, JWST focused use cases. Um, again, with uh, simulated data first, um, and then also give you sort of a teaser uh, of some preliminary results with on-sky JWST near cam data. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll sort of summarize what, what these can enable for, for the future um, and specifically what, uh, what I'm planning to work on. So um, the most prolific exoplanet detection methods to date are, of course, uh, the so-called indirect detection methods, such as transit or radial velocity. Um, so by comparison, direct imaging of exoplanets yields many fewer detections, uh, being responsible for only around 1% of all exoplanets discovered to date. Um, so uh, if we look closer, though, at this figure um, showing planet semi-major axis versus system age, 
uh, we can see that direct imaging makes uh, much more significant contributions in some niches. Um, so contributing, for example, around 71% of all planets with semi-major axes larger than 10 AU, uh, and around 65% of those with ages less than 300 million years. Uh, and so despite the comparatively low yield, uh, direct imaging serves as an important complement for other detection techniques. Um, and so by contributing uh, discoveries like Cap Andromeda B here, uh, shown on the right, um, a uh, so this is a substellar object uh, near the deuterium burning limit, um, orbiting a young uh, B9 star uh, and with a semi-major axis at least twice out of Neptune. Um, so by contributing objects like these, uh, direct imaging provides important constraints in areas of this sort of uh, grand uh, senses of exoplanets uh, that are not easily probed by other methods. Um, and so additionally, um, direct imaging provides us with another really uh, exciting opportunity, um, especially for me, um, which is uh, to enable the study of circumstellar disks. So um, circum circumstellar disks are simply the disks of gas and dust around stars from which planets are thought to form. Um, so by observing circumstellar disks, we can identify morphological features um, such as gap spirals, uh, cavities, warps, et cetera, uh, that might suggest the presence of a yet unseen uh, planet or uh, substellar companion. Um, and so in the center here is a sort of textbook example of this. Uh, so this is PDS-70, uh, where a possible planet-induced uh, inner cavity um, was reported by Hashimoto et al. 2015, um, before eventually uh, Kepler et al. 2018 uh, announced the imaging of a planet in the cavity, uh, with a second planet um, being recovered in the cavity shortly thereafter. Um, so while modern technology allows us to recover planets and disks, uh, they can be extremely challenging to verify for a num number of reasons that we'll uh, dig into um, shortly. Um, so an example of a, a sort of uh, less um, uh, pretty outcome is the case of Lacalcium 15, uh, where in 2015, three possible planets were reported within the previously known outer disk. Um, so you can see those little signatures here. Um, and then subsequently, Curry et al. 2019 reported recovery of an additional uh, inner ring at the location of these planets, um, and ultimately suggest that these prior candidates were probably uh, merely a partial detection of this inner disk structure. Um, so the primary challenge for imaging disks and planets is the much brighter diffracted starlight, also known as the stellar point spread function, or PSF. Um, that we have to dig through in order to recover any faint circumstellar signal like disks or planets. Um, so on the right here is an animation that will hopefully help put this into context. Um, so the images here are of the spiral-armed disk system, AB Auriga, um, captured from the Subaru telescope. So on the left is the raw image before post-processing efforts to remove the bright pattern of, of diffracted starlight. Um, and then on the right is the result following uh, PSF subtraction, uh, in which you can just barely make out the disk um, over here. Uh, so um, as we tune the brightness um, to uh, make our, our image on the left totally uh, unreadable, um, you can see that the, uh, the, the disk of Avia Riga uh, starts to emerge. Um, and so uh, even for an extremely bright disk uh, such as Avia Riga, we have to remove a lot of stellar, uh, stellar signal uh, starlight to uh, reach circumstellar signal. Um, and so I'll also point out that this is after using an array of uh, other sophisticated uh, hardware tools um, to sort of ease the contrast that we have to achieve. Um, so generally speaking, uh, high contrast imaging is uh, possible thanks to the confluence of three key technologies. Um, so these are adaptive optics, um, which correct for distortion of the incoming light. Uh, so for ground-based observatories, this is atmospheric distortion for the most part. Um, then coronography, which blocks the intense central light of the parent star to ease recovery of nearby circumstellar signal, um, and differential imaging techniques, which is kind of what we'll focus on today. Um, and so these help us to separate planet and disk light in the data. Um, so these are sort of observational techniques that we then, we then combine with uh, post-processing uh, algorithms to effectively separate uh, star and uh, circumstellar light. Um, and so these animations uh, in the upper right here um, are just kind of a, a demo of, of the improvement that uh, the adaptive optics systems that we use um, provide. So this is the uh, so-called extreme AO system, which is the sort of name for the second gen AO um, at the Subaru Observatory. So with no adaptive optics, the uh, star dances all over the place. Um, 
and there's not a lot of uh, science that you can do there at uh, high spatial resolution. Uh, and then on the right here, we have this much more stable uh, picture that, that Extreme AO gives us. Um, and so more recently, uh, these capabilities have been further enhanced uh, with the addition of integral field spectrographs, or IFSs. Uh, so IFSs provide images in an array of wavelengths, uh, which each, with each exposure producing a three-dimensional image cube, like the one in the bottom right here, in which the X and Y spatial dimensions for our uh, sort of conventional imager are supplemented with a new wavelength axis. So um, IFS data can be used to help verify and characterize exoplanet candidates. Um, and it can also provide some exciting opportunities for studying uh, the dust properties and composition of disks. Um, so by using these tools to study planet forming disks, we can directly observe the process of planet formation. Uh, and in doing so, gain access to a massive amount of information regarding uh, the sort of mechanisms that drive or, or limit this. Um, so early imaging efforts uh, for disks seem to suggest that systems with these so-called signposts of planet formation, uh, spiral arms, warps, et cetera, uh, were relatively rare. Um, however, uh, these more modern uh, instruments and, and uh, data from them uh, have started to paint a different picture, um, that these sort of structures are in fact nearly ubiquitous. Um, so this can be seen in the ALMA survey uh, from Francis and Van der Merrill 2020 um, on the right here, uh, in which almost every single disk uh, exhibits at least one of these features, um, be it uh, gaps, um, some spiral arms here, uh, or um, asymmetries between the rings. Um, and so, uh, these are, yeah, again, pretty much ubiquitous. Um, so the, the closer we look at disks, the, the, more, uh, the more structure we're, we're revealing. Uh, these aren't just some rare one-off um, freak disks that we happen to come across. Uh, what remains unclear, though, is how reliably these structures actually predict the presence of planets. Um, so to date, very few planets have been confirmed within disks. Um, and as I noted previously, uncovering planets in disks is uh, generally extremely difficult. Uh, and so even when the quality of data products isn't the limiting factor, uh, identifying point sources in disks uh, isn't enough uh, because of structure like this. Um, so as illustrated uh, here in Gaspar and Ricci 2020, uh, who suggested a previously detected point source in Fomalhaut's disk uh, is likely an expanding clump of dust. Um, so this is uh, especially relevant for, for more chaotic young disks like AB Arica, uh, where disk structure could very easily manifest as a point-like feature in the disk. Um, and so we might, uh, while we might use other tools like uh, IFS data to disambiguate various possibilities, um, as you'll see shortly, a, a number of factors con contributed by our post-processing methods, uh, leveraging this differential imaging data, uh, make this even more challenging uh, for the majority of, of disk systems. Um, so what is, what is differential imaging? Um, so I'm going to give you a quick summary here, and, and hopefully we can go from there to kind of uh, paint a picture of, of uh, where our problems arise here. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, this is uh, simply an observational technique uh, that allows us to separate uh, starlight and circumstellar signal uh, in our data. So circumstellar signal, uh, I'll abbreviate just to CSS um, going forward. Um, so perhaps the most widely used of these is angular differential imaging, or ADI, where we allow the field of view to rotate as we track the target. Um, and so. Uh, I have an image here, and so before I play this animation, um, I just highlight a few things. So these four points here are what we call the astro grid, um, and these are intentionally induced AO artifacts that uh, simplify uh, sort of centering the data and performing astrometry um, as well as photometry um, in situations where we have used a coronagraph um, like we have here. Um, so the central uh, starlight is blocked, but we've induced these artifacts that sort of let us uh, still have an idea of not only where that star is, uh, but also how bright it is. Um, and then uh, very critically, um, this data happens to have a brown dwarf companion that's visible in, in the RAWs. Um, so this would be considered a very low contrast companion, um, but uh, is good for illustrative purposes. Um, and so then I also have a little compass here. Um, and so as we uh, take our images throughout the night, you can see that this sort of um, pattern of diffracted starlight kind of acts like a, uh, a kaleidoscope of sorts, um, but remains more or less uh, fixed to the plane of, of, the, uh, of the instrument. Um, whereas the, uh, any circumstellar signal will appear to rotate with the, uh, with the sky as we track this target. 
Um, and so what we would do then is uh, we have this sequence of images and in the very uh, simplest uh, classical case, we could just say, take a median of this stack of images. Um, and since the uh, companion here is sort of the outlier uh, across the sequence at any given position, um, we'll effectively remove it. And then we can simply subtract that, that median image um, from each of the constituents, uh, derotate them to align them and average them together. Um, and so that's the sort of classical PSF subtraction scenario uh, for, for ADI specifically. Um, and we have other techniques uh, such as uh, SDI, spectral differential imaging, where we observe at multiple wavelengths. As we sort of flip through our, our uh, different wavelengths here, uh, you can again see that the, uh, the brown dwarf is stationary um, while the speckle field, the diffraction pattern of the star uh, scales with wavelength. And so if we want to kind of create a similar picture as we had over here, where it's our, our source that's now the outlier, our, our brown dwarf, um, we can just rescale the images spatially with wavelength to get the diffraction pattern aligned. And in the classical scenario, uh, use this very much the same way. Um, and so then uh, finally, uh, the most relevant of these uh, sort of, well, among the most relevant of these techniques for, for disks is reference star differential imaging. Uh, and in reference to our differential imaging, we simply observe a second target that doesn't have any circumstellar signal. Um, and we do this as close in time as possible to the, uh, to the, the target star um, in order to capture this, this uh, diffraction pattern. Um, and again, as we flip through this, even though there's no circumstellar signal, you can see that there's these subtle changes. Um, and so for this reason, um, the sort of classical PSF subtraction scenario uh, doesn't tend to be very good um, at, at suppressing starlight at small separations or for ground-based data. Uh, so generally within around two arc seconds or so, uh, even for space-based data, um, you start to run into issues of significant leftover starlight. Um, and so instead, the most common way of uh, handling this changing uh, point spread function um, is to take a whole bunch of images like this um, and then to find some way of combining them um, be it a uh, sort of principal components analysis based approach, uh, et cetera, to best match our target data. So to try and reproduce the, the sort of uh, very specific diffraction pattern that we observed for the target from this sequence of images. Um, and it turns out that this helps uh, quite a bit for detecting um, faint structures at, at smaller separations. Um, and it's pretty much necessary for, for ground-based data. Um, Right, and so this is typically what we use uh, for high contrast imaging. Um, classical PSF subtraction is, uh, is useful still for uh, JWST at large separations or, or HST, but otherwise uh, we pretty much turn to making some combination of a sequence of images to uh, sort of most effectively get rid of our starlight. Um, so where do we run into issues? Um, so I'm gonna focus here on the RDI scenario. Um, because again, this is most relevant for disks. Um, in the ADI scenario, since disks are extended, you, you quickly run into issues where uh, your circumstellar signal is no longer the outlier at a given position. Um, and uh, you can end up losing a lot of signal that way. So RDI tends to be favored for extended structures like, like circumstellar disks. Um, so uh, imagine we have a, a target uh, that we've observed. And this target image contains both uh, I star, which is the stellar diffraction pattern, and also uh, IC, which is the uh, circumstellar signal, in this case, uh, uh, inclined circumstellar disk, right? And so uh, we don't know which is which initially. We just have this single image containing these two sources. Um, and then we also have, uh, as part of our, our RDI data sequence, um, these reference images. So we'll just call this uh, script R in this sequence of reference images. Uh, and these contain only starlight. Um, so kind of the common method that I was describing um, so again, you could use something like PCA to build this combination of images that best matches I. But in this case, for simplicity, we'll imagine we're just using a linear combination. So we're just using good old linear algebra to figure out what combination of these uh, images in, in this set R uh, best uh, minimizes this data. Um, and so while this works quite well for point sources and, and say a, a large field of view where they take up a, a very small fraction of, of the field of view, so you mostly just have starlight overlapping starlight um, and you get quite a good model that way. Um, when we do this with uh, disks, what we end up with um, is a model which will denote uh, M. And so in general, uh, this, this script M with the I and the script R is just saying this is a model that we've constructed 
by comparing this reference data to this, uh, this target image I. Um, and so in this case, uh, as you can plainly see, um, so this is at the same brightness scale as the other images, our starlight image uh, or model of the starlight is way too bright. Um, and so when we go back and subtract this from our data, and we'll call these uh, our, our data residuals uh, IR, um, we end up with something like this. Uh, and so comparing this to our sort of input uh, underlying circumstellar signal, uh, you can see that our, our stellar, or sorry, our, our actual product is significantly diminished. Um, and so in these color maps, I have blue sort of corresponding to negative regions and red corresponding to positive. Of course, negative fluxes are nonsense. And it's purely the result of the fact that we're uh, fitting starlight um, in our reference data to minimize star plus disk light. Um, effectively, uh, it's no longer a very good assumption that our, our circumstellar signal is, is the outlier here. Um, and so uh, this causes some serious issues. Um, so uh, for starters, um, just to be clear, this isn't some uh, limitation of our, our, of our uh, observatory. I'm sorry, I'm joking, um, of our observatory. Um, this is just a, a fact uh, of us building the model this way. Um, even if our contains exactly an image of the starlight in our data, we're going to get significant over subtraction. Um, and the other thing that's really important to note is that this is not constant. So this varies spatially. Um, and not only that, but it varies spectrally and over time. So you can get very different results uh, reducing data this way um, just by observing with the exact same settings uh, two weeks later if the observing conditions are a little bit different. Um, and also, if you're using IFS data, uh, you can have over subtraction in, in one sort of wavelength channel that's twice as high as in another wavelength channel. And so if we want to use this to try and uh, make measurements of, of the sort of SED of the disk or, or a companion, uh, we run into issues because the color uh, that we're going to measure, the SED, the shape, is affected by over subtraction. Um, and so uh, this is a well-known problem. Um, and the, the sort of normal way of handling this is through uh, what's called forward modeling. And so uh, again, I have our, our result image here just as sort of a reminder. Um, so for a given input model image, uh, which we'll call I sub M, um, the idea with forward modeling is to induce PSF subtraction effects to sort of simulate the effect of our, our, of our post-processing. And this very simple uh, RDI framework, this is actually super easy to calculate. It's, it's literally just replacing our target image with our image containing only the model uh, of the disk um, and, and performing RDI. And so effectively, um, the, the signal that we lose to over subtraction is just whatever combination of the reference data minimizes the, the, uh, simula the, yeah, so the simulated disk, the disk model. And so we end up with an output that looks very similar to our, our actual um, result for, for the real data. Um, and so this is very helpful. Uh, and uh, in the case of isolated point sources, um, this is really straightforward to go from this to getting a measurement of throughput anywhere in the field of view. And the reason is that we know, um, you know, as, assuming we know what the shape of the, the PSF is, um, which, you know, for, for data like this, we have those satellite spots, the astro grid that we can use to measure the shape of the PSF, uh, roughly speaking. Um, so we know how the light for a point source will be distributed uh, based on this point spread function. Um, and so we can just very, in a straightforward manner, come up with a, a sort of function to give us what the throughput is at any location. And so this makes it pretty easy for an isolated point source to then back out what the, the true flux uh, would have been before it was affected by, by this. Um, extended sources uh, are a much different problem. Um, and so effectively, the entire field of view is relevant. Um, you cannot assess what the throughput is at one position without considering what the input disk signal was at every other position within the field of view. Um, and so, as you might imagine, uh, this, this complicates things. This is a, a fairly uh, challenging problem. Um, and so, normally, the way this is approached is just by having some sort of parameterization for a, a disk um, that seems appropriate based on you know, how it looks in your data. Um, and then you just evaluate disk models this way. So you generate a model IM, you run it through, and you compare that output to your real data. Um, and you uh, do that uh, a whole lot, um, thousands and thousands of times, um, until you can say, 
hey, this is the most consistent result with our data. Um, and hopefully that there's not any other sort of input disks that are also consistent with your data. Um, and uh, so this gives us some uh, way in which to uh, conduct analysis of, of our disks that's robust to the effects of signal loss. So we can at least measure, you know, sort of the orientation of, of simple disks like this. We can measure, uh, figure out what their, their flux distribution is, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but again, this is uh, extremely time consuming. So that's the first sort of issue here. But, you know, we have fancy computers. We can just throw our fancy computers at it and, and wait. Um, but the bigger issue um, is that this is totally infeasible for highly structured disks. Um, imagine a, a complicated spiral arm disk, and you're trying to come up with some parameterization, and you have to throw you know, uh, detailed hydrodynamical simulations at it to get a single disk model. It takes you know, hours or days, depending on what sort of system you're running, uh, for a single model. Uh, and then you have you know, 50 parameters that you have to tune. Um, and then, of course, you know this is compounded still when you consider IFS data, where we have to do this at a huge array of wavelengths. Um, so this is this is a problem. This is a, a significant limitation for our ability to make measurements using this state-of-the-art, uh, you know, IFS with extreme AO or or space-based data um, to to study these these very uh, young structured disks. Um, so uh, an additional type of differential imaging, um, which I'd like to uh, highlight here and which will be relevant later, is uh, polarimetric differential imaging. And so this helps us quite a bit uh, for studying disk specifically. Um, and so uh, light, of course, uh, can oscillate in any direction. It can go up and down like the blue or, or left and right like the red here. Um, and in general, if light tends to oscillate in one direction more than others, we say that light is polarized. Um, and so critically, uh, starlight is uh, more or less unpolarized, um, whereas the light from circumstellar disks is highly polarized. Uh, it turns out that when uh, light is scattered by this dust in the disk towards us, um, the, the effect of that uh, is to um, have very high polarization of, of this incoming light. And so uh, we tend to expect disks uh, to be polarized at a level of, of 30 to 70%. Um, and so without getting into the details for the sake of time and everyone's sanity, um, PDI effectively eliminates unpolarized light. Uh, polarimetric differential imaging uh, gives us a final product in which only the polarized intensity signal um, remains. Um, and so this is really awesome for the purpose of disk studies and studying morphology of disks, et cetera, uh, because the disk signal and polarized intensity is unattenuated. Um, we're not just using some, some trickery in which we assume that the disk is an outlier like we are with the other differential imaging techniques. We're using a, a physical property of the light, its polarization, to uh, isolate the, the disk signal. Um, the, the sort of drawback here and the reason that uh, we don't just forget about all the other techniques and only use PDI from now on um, is that uh, self-luminous young planets um, are not expected, at least in, in the sort of uh, infrared regime um, to be very polarized. Um, so these are likely to be extremely difficult to uncover using polarized intensity imagery alone. Um, so kind of moving into uh, the, the topic of today um, in, in more detail, uh, this will be sort of our, our use case target. This will be, um, and, and really this is the reason that, that I started most of this, uh, of this work is uh, Abiarica. Um, and so AB Auriga is an A0 star uh, around 1 to 3 million years old and at a distance around 156 parsecs. Uh, and this has this really incredible protoplanetary disk that I showed you before um, that has these uh, spiral arms that, um, so you have this sort of main ring here, and then you have spiral arms inside of the ring and outside as well, extending to uh, hundreds or thousands of AU. Um, and so these have been observed in optical near IR and in CO. Um, and then in submillimeter, um, uh, Francis et al. Uh, 2020 um, reported this ALMA image uh, in which the, um, we see a significantly depleted inner cavity. Um, and so uh, this is sort of the, the main ring here. Um, and we see you know, largely uh, a dearth of material inside. Um, and so again, this is sort of suggestive of, of the possibility um, you know, and combined with these spiral arms that there might be something sort of uh, some massive uh, companion in there sweeping up material. 
Um, so we observed this target with uh, Subaru Skexeo Keras. Um, so this is its uh, extreme AO system paired with the uh, Keras IFS uh, in October of 2020 to help verify a companion candidate. Um, and so here's the early images of this companion candidate. This is plotted at the same scale as the ALMA image here. Um, and so uh, we needed help, uh, needed more data to try and verify this. And so uh, sort of tantalizingly, this source falls exactly where we expect something uh, that's carving out this ring to fall. Uh, and in fact, um, exactly where it was predicted based on some, some dynamical simulations from, from prior groups. Um, and so uh, we first observed this with the classical IFS mode, so just standard IFS, um, over 116 minutes. Uh, and this is using the standard uh, broadband low resolution mode for Keras, which gives us 22 wavelengths uh, spanning the near IR, JH, and K bands. So this is in a two by two arc second field of view. Um, and this is just flipping through our 22 wavelengths. Um, and then in addition to this, uh, the following night, uh, we carried out observations with um, a new and rather unique observing mode for Keras. Uh, which combines uh, polarimetric imaging of, of PDI with IFS data. Um, and so what this does is it gives us uh, PDI products at the same array of wavelengths as um, the total intensity classical mode, uh, but in a slightly reduced field of view. So um, what we get is this, uh, these two uh, orthogonal polarized images, uh, each of which has a one by two arc second field of view, uh, but otherwise with the same wavelength coverage. Um, and so uh, I summarized this new observing mode in a, a SPI proceeding in 2021. Um, if you're interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to read more about it um, there. Uh, so processing this data and sort of running through the, the textbook tools, um, here's what we, we get with the initial results. Um, so in polarized intensity, uh, so this is a, a coverage map. So again, um, we have this field of view that rotates throughout the night, so uh, Skexio only observes in the sort of ADI mode that I was describing before. Um, and so as a result, we sort of have this field of view of partial coverage throughout our sequence. So I've highlighted the first and last frames in the sequence here uh, to give you an idea of why we have this sort of funny Pac-Man looking um, uh, final product. Um, but in any case, uh, here's what we get. Um, so we detect the inner disk in all 22 wavelength channels. So just sort of flipping through things here. Um, we have this really nice, you know, again, spiral arm structure. Um, and we can, of course, average these, these images uh, over the wavelength axis to get this nice uh, higher signal noise ratio image, uh, like you see here. Um, and so initially, uh, at a glance, we, we don't see any obvious counterpart in the polarized intensity to, to, to B. Um, so this is uh, sort of compelling, but um, not, not conclusive, um, because uh, in polarized intensity, you have a very different uh, distribution of light um, that's expected just by uh, how the angle of, of uh, scatter affects the, the rate of polarization. Um, and so we need to do some more work to make sure that this isn't uh, at least just a, a sort of result of this different scattering phase function. Um, and then also, you know, presumably we'd want to compare this with total intensity. Um, and so in total intensity, B is of course still visible. Um, so here it is in the sort of very over-subtracted uh, angular differential imaging result uh, over and self-subtracted. Um, uh, we've lost, as you can see, uh, most of the disk signal here, but we do get a nice detection of this sort of little uh, extended blob here. Um, and then in RDI, again, uh, we get this telltale uh, negative background region uh, resulting from over-subtraction. Um, and so uh, at this stage, um, are sort of early measurements of the orbital motion of this object. Um, we had HST data spanning back uh, almost a decade uh, that you know, at least gave us some indication that this was uh, moving in an orbital fashion. Um, but in order to do much more than that, um, we need to quantify or, or eliminate attenuation in our total intensity products. Um, so if we can do that, then we can uh, measure the spectrum for this, this position, uh, and then also say that it's distinct from the spectrum of the nearby disk. Uh, with this over-subtracted data that has some unknown amount of over-subtraction uh, in each individual wavelength and in each position, we can't really say much of anything about uh, spectrum uh, with any confidence. Um, and then if we want to be able to you know, sort of assess the, uh, the fractional polarization, the ratio of polarized to total intensity, 
um, we again need to uh, make sure that we actually have a meaningful measurement of the total intensity. Um, and right, so unfortunately, our sort of uh, textbook way of doing that through forward modeling is completely infeasible. Um, you, uh, it would take you uh, billions of CPU hours to be able to get a faithful one-to-one -one reproduction of this disk using a synthetic model at all 22 wavelengths. Um, so instead, we need a different solution. Um, so kind of as a reminder, I've just put up the schematic of the RDI reduction process and, and the, the result and how we end up with this over subtraction. Um, so what I'd like to point out um, is that this sort of standard way of, of getting the, uh, the residuals here that gives us this image, um, if we instead knew initially what the underlying circumstellar signal was, uh, I sub C, uh, we could eliminate over subtraction. We could just compute our, our residual image like this um, by building our PSF model um, by comparing R to I with uh, the circumstellar signal subtracted, right? So by definition, then, our data uh, that we're building the model with contains no circumstellar signal, um, and we're not affected by this over subtraction effect. Um, so of course, we don't know what IC is uh, going into this, or we'd already be done, right? That's, that's literally the thing that we're going after. So we have this sort of funny catch-22 situation. Um, however, uh, if we can approximate it, um, we should be able to mitigate this effect. Um, so uh, in that case, um, we'll denote an estimate of this, uh, this circumstellar signal uh, as IC naught, um, and the residuals would just be computed by replacing IC with IC naught, right? Um, and so we'll refer to this as constrained RDI. Um, and so this is the post-processing technique that I'm sort of highlighting here. Um, and so how can we approximate this disk signal um, in any meaningful way. Um, so as a reminder, uh, we have some really good information about what the polarized intensity of the disk is. Um, and so this technique uh, we've called polarimetry constrained RDI or PCRDI, um, right? And so we have this unattenuated polarized intensity of the disk, which we'll call PC. Um, and this is just our, our PDI result. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we have a pretty good idea of how the angle that the light is scattered by uh, affects the rate of polarization. Um, and so we'll call this f pol. And so this is uh, the ratio of polarized to total intensity. Um, and this is generally proportional to this term here, which isn't, the details are important, but the phi here is the, the scattering angle um, at each position in our image. Uh, so effectively the scattering angle that we're, that we're probing on average at that pixel. Um, and so basically, uh, if we can use prior information to estimate uh, what the scattering surface is, so some simple schematic of the disk uh, that's um, you know, kind of giving us uh, an idea of, of uh, how we think the light should be scattered towards us, um, then we can use this estimate of the fractional polarization, which I'll denote f pol naught, um, to uh, we can divide our polarized intensity by that to get a total intensity estimate. Um, and so, so doing that in this uh, sort of simple toy model case, uh, we get something like this um, that looks uh, quite a bit like the actual underlying disk. Um, and so then, uh, as described before, we proceed by just um, building our PSF model by comparing the reference data to the target data with this estimate subtracted from it, and then computing our residuals by subtracting this uh, PSF model from the original data um, without trying to remove this uh, initially. Um, and so the result there, um, of course, still has noise because uh, you know it's not magic. Um, but uh, we've gotten rid of this sort of systematic over subtraction effect, um, and so we end up much closer to the uh, ideal result, the true underlying circumstellar signal, than we do with the conventional RDI approach. Um, so it turns out. Uh, that we don't actually have to know much of anything about the scattering surface of the disk going into this. Uh, in fact, we can just directly optimize um, for the uh, sort of transformation of polarized to total intensity uh, via some assumed scattering surface that uh, best uh, suits our data. Um, right, and so uh, in this case, we'll assume some simple scattering surface model that uh, has a height um, that's a function of radius and uh, three parameters, A, B, and C, uh, not very important um, for, for understanding this. Uh, and then some orientation, PA, and inclination, 
so position angle and inclination, and some peak fractional polarization, which um, would just scale uh, depending on what wavelengths and uh, what, what the material in the disk is. So we have six free parameters. Um, and what we can do then is find the sum of some uh, model of the PSF, uh, the stellar PSF, and our model, our estimate of the circumstellar signal um, that best matches I. Uh, and so in other words, um, we're minimizing y, where y is just the difference of i and this, this sum here, um, our, the sum of our, our estimate of the stellar signal and our estimate of the circumstellar signal. Um, and so I'll, I'll note here that this is literally just a standard RDI reduction um, where we've replaced our target image with our um, estimate subtracted target image throughout. Um, and so to test this, uh, we built a synthetic Keras RDI data set um, containing an AB Auriga like spiral arm disk um, with some corresponding polarized intensity uh, data as well. Um, and so to do this, we split a large starlight only uh, unsky Keras data set um, into a uh, sequence of, uh, so a target data sequence and a reference data sequence. So basically, uh, three fourths of the data we said was target, and one fourth we said was reference. Um, and so then into the target uh, part of that sequence, we uh, took this multi-wavelength uh, model. I've just shown it in the wavelength collapse version here. Um, but we've taken this, this disk model, rotated it to the appropriate angles, and injected that into our target sequence um, at contrast comparable to AB Arica's disk. Um, and so we can illustrate now uh, sort of what this uh, optimization process looks like in practice. Um, so again, here's our input disk down here. Um, and so uh, I'll, again, uh, mention that these are wavelength averaged images. Here's the sort of initial conventional RDI result with the terrible over subtraction we've talked about. Um, and then here's our objective function. So this is our, our Y, our thing that we're trying to minimize. Um, without getting into the details, uh, one of the neat things about uh, RDI is that we can actually um, perform the optimization uh, we can uh, figure out what the best or optimal PSF model is within one region and then perform this subtraction over uh, the, whole, the whole image, right? Um, so for this purpose, we're just going to be comparing it in this region here. Uh, and the reason is, um, as mentioned, that uh, we're assuming a smooth, simple scattering surface. Um, but for this disk, and uh, we suspect, um, based on prior literature for AB Auriga, there's actually a misinclination um, at the location of this uh, the boundary between the outer and inner ring. Um, so we don't want to try and fit a single smooth scattering surface model to the entire image. So instead, we're just fitting in this dashed region here. Um, and so initially, our objective function is identical to the conventional RDI result. And that's because we're not assuming any sort of constraint. Uh, we're not assuming any uh, estimate of the disk signal. So it just simplifies to uh, just the RDI result. Um, and then up at the top here, we have a metric that's sort of intended to gauge uh, how well we're doing in each individual wavelength channel. So the metric is percent attenuated. Um, and so this is just uh, 100 times 1 minus the output image uh, over the input image. Um, and so uh, values over 100 here correspond to uh, negative regions, for example, um, where we've uh, gotten rid of more than 100% of the disk signal. Um, and so uh, what we have here is in each of the individual 22 Keras wavelength channels, um, the points mark the median over all resolution elements for that wavelength. So basically, over all of the pixels of that wavelength, uh, how much do we tend to lose to over subtraction? Um, and then the shaded region denotes the 16th to 84th uh, percentile over those same resolution elements. So basically, uh, the uh, width in the y direction here is indicative of the spatial variation in over subtraction. Um, and then the variations in the uh, x direction this way are, are indicative of um, the sort of um, wavelength dependence of over subtraction. Um, and so as we uh, optimize away um, and tune our estimate uh, to minimize um, the, the values in this region here, you can see that we um, very effectively uh, pretty much eliminate uh, this, this attenuation. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, we end up with something like uh, zero plus or minus 0.7% uh, on average per wavelength channel uh, versus, you know, 75% plus or minus a lot uh, in, the, in the initial result. Um, 
So we can take a closer look now uh, at, at these results. And so one thing I'd like to highlight here, um, so we have on the top row is the total intensity wavelength average product again. So we have the input disk model here, the conventional RDI result, um, and then this is our best guess estimate um, that we use in PCRDI, and then the PCRDI result itself. Um, then on the bottom row, uh, we have the corresponding fractional polarization maps. Um, and so these uh, proceed again left to right. Uh, we have our input disk, um, fractional polarization, so on and so forth. Um, and so what I'll highlight though, is of course in RDI, um, we pretty much have nothing. Uh, it's non-physical over 80% of the region. Um, whereas in uh, our fractional polarization estimate is again, uh, if you squint, kind of looks like the true, uh, the true measurement. Um, but loses a lot of this fine structure. And then finally, the PCRDI result, um, where we, uh, despite the fact that we're using this very simple estimate of the surface um, and this very simple estimate of the fractional polarization, we've managed to recover the majority of this fine structure. Um, and so what I'd like to highlight then is that, uh, you know, we can effectively over or underestimate uh, the circumstellar signal uh, as long as the, the over and underestimation uh, balance in these squares. And so effectively, even with these spiral arms, uh, just by sort of threading the needle with our surface, uh, that we assume, um, we can still uh, estimate um, the CSS effectively and effectively uh, eliminate RDI over subtraction. Um, so making uh, some, some measurements here, uh, we might want to compare PCRDI with the sort of textbook model corrected version. Um, so here we're making forward modeling corrections to our RDI measurements using two different models. Um, so the first of these is the very, very, very ideal case. Um, I didn't want to actually fit this data with models. So I just literally assumed um, that we had successfully identified literally the underlying ground truth disk model. Um, and so this is what that looks like. Uh, so forward modeling, we get fairly close. Uh, and then the residuals just end up being, uh, you know, noting the difference in scale, the uh, remaining starlight and background noise. Um, and then the second is sort of a more realistic case where we've said, eh, we're, we're never going to fit those spiral arms. Let's just sort of try and reproduce the bulk structure. Um, and in this case, uh, our results um, are, are much, uh, we have much more significant residuals. And surprisingly, we see those bright spiral arms. Um, and so again, I'll, I'll just emphasize, this is, uh, you would never, ever, ever actually get a result from modeling that's, that's this good. But I wanted to see how we compared uh, if we measured some, some disk surface brightness um, using this very ideal case and compared it with PCRDI. Um, so we measure surface brightness and color in uh, J minus H, I think, um, across two profiles. So a horizontal profile and a vertical profile. Um, for the sake of time, uh, we'll just cut to the difference. So this is showing uh, relative to the ground truth, this dashed line, um, how different we are. Uh, and with one sig or sorry, three sigma actually confidence intervals with the shaded region. So PCRDI in blue, uh, very close throughout. The ideal case, uh, sort of the very best case scenario, actually ends up, uh, which was surprising to me initially, uh, further from the PCRDI result here. Um, and then the uncorrected RDI and the realistic RDI correction are off in the weeds somewhere. Um, and so looking at the color uh, across these profiles, um, you see a similar thing. Um, so the, the corrected uh, realistic version and the uncorrected are kind of all over the place. Um, and the PCRDI is uh, still um, at least a little bit better than the ideal case throughout. Um, so this is sort of unintuitive uh, initially, but um, consider that the forward modeling correction, uh, we're basically saying, how much signal did we lose in, in processing this model? OK, let's uh, figure out what that fraction is and scale our, our real data by that amount. Um, and so effectively, this is assuming that all residual flux is from CSS, circumstellar signal, and that noise and residual uh, starlight are not present. Um, but of course, they are. Uh, so we end up scaling these as well. And so functionally, uh, even with a perfect model, um, you, you cannot uh, get a perfect result out. You cannot uh, effectively eliminate over subtraction. Um, and then additionally, since your noise is corrected alongside your signal, your signal noise ratio is unchanged. Um, and so finally, uh, we can apply this to a Eureka. Um, and so optimizing this constraint, um, what you can see is that uh, in this wavelength average image, we go from our terribly over subtractor result to a nice uh, high throughput result. And it's a, generally a dramatic improvement. Um, so looking at this in individual uh, band passes of so JH and K versus the uh, wavelength average broadband, 
Um, you can again see this effect of the sort of wavelength dependence of over subtraction. Um, and so this reveals that the position of the candidate, um, first, a fractional polarization deficit. So comparing our best fit estimate of the circumstellar signal to the actual PCRDI result, um, again, with our optimization region highlighted, you can see that we're not able to find anything that vaguely resembles uh, the would-be planet candidate out here, even you know, assuming uh, the differences, reasonable differences in the scattering surface, uh, or sorry, the scattering phase functions. Um, and so then in addition to this, um, we find a distinct spectrum at the position of AB or EKB. And so you can actually see this qualitatively uh, by comparing, uh, sorry, by comparing the, say, the J and H band um, and J band, uh, it stands out much more relative to the nearby disk than it does in the K band. Um, but of course, we can also uh, measure this. So making measurements directly across the position, um, looking at the J minus K color, what you can see is that PCRDI, which is in blue, uh, shows a very confident and, and localized dip. Um, so a slightly bluer color, um, which is not unexpected um, for some reasons I won't get into. Uh, and then in the RDI case, it's, it's a mess. Um, we, we do get a dip, but it's more, much gentler, and it certainly does not uh, you know, reach its, its minimum anywhere near the position of, of the candidate. Um, and so based on this, as well as a whole lot of other results um, and, and analysis, we're able to confirm uh, AB Ariga B as a likely protoplanet. Um, and so this is a nine Jupiter mass uh, embedded companion at a separation around 93 AU. And perhaps most uh, excitingly, um, this provides some of the first strong evidence for gravitational instability planet formation. Uh, we have this, this source at, at an age less than 3 million years at a separation three times that of Neptune. And there's simply not time at that separation to accumulate uh, nine Jupiter masses through core accretion. Um, and so, of course, uh, the, the sort of alternate scenario that's often proposed for large separation massive planets is migration along the lines of our own solar system's Jupiter. Um, but again, uh, the timescales at work here um, don't seem to be sufficient for that. Uh, you know, we're looking at less than 3 million years. Um, and so combined with the sort of incredible spiral arms that you expect to see for gravitational instability, um, we suspect that this is likely a, uh, um, a gravitationally uh, gravitational instability formed protoplanet. Um, so again, read more about this in uh, Curry et al. 2022 if you're interested. Um, so really quickly, uh, based on the prior analysis, um, you might be thinking, um, well, so is there a better way to use the results of forward modeling um, rather than sort of correcting it after the fact? Um, and so the answer is um, that any disk that can be modeled, uh, we can actually use a variant, um, which I've called model constrained RDI, MCRDI, um, to uh, better suppress over subtraction. Um, so we can just replace our PI-based CSS estimate with a fully synthetic disk model. Um, and so uh, as I sort of alluded, it turns out that optimization is identical to the objective that we normally use for forward modeling optimization. So the results won't just be similar, they'll be, uh, the parameters that you get will be identical. Um, and so in general, this should be considered a more effective way of using the information from, from disk modeling. Um, I would consider this, uh, 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 you know, I think this should be considered a replacement for the, the sort of example of forward modeling corrections that we used before. Um, so we applied this in the paper to some uh, simple simulations of uh, JWST near cam observations. We have here the input disk model, the uh, classical RDI result, um, where we end up with these significant stellar residuals, the uh, over subtracted conventional RDI results is using PCA based uh, reduction. Um, from the JWST pipeline, and then the model constrained RDI result. Um, and similarly, uh, since starting at Goddard, I've had the opportunity to start participating in the early release science program, um, where there's uh, a whole lot of fun simulations to work with. So in this case, this is the disk of HD 141569A with some planets injected by ESA at a Space Telescope. Um, and so processing this the same way, we're able to very effectively separate out this one Jupiter mass and two Jupiter mass companion. Um, and so uh, finally, um, real on sky, real life uh, application. I'll note that this is a preliminary unpublished result. Um, so please don't tweet this or anything. Um, but uh, this is application to a very young, uh, highly inclined debris disk system. And so we have 3.6 micron and 4.4 uh, RDI along the top and MCRDI on the bottom. And so right away, you can see, um, you know, there's a, without doing any further analysis, there's significant uh, improvement. We've gotten rid of these uh, significant negative regions. 
Um, and we can make higher fidelity measurements of, of this sort of brightness profile of this disk and also more effectively probe it for uh, the presence of planets. Um, and sorry, so this is just the same image with a one over R correction to sort of highlight the extents of the disk. Um, and so finally, just to quickly highlight some broader applications, uh, it turns out that you can actually use PCRDI with a totally different uh, instrument's PI. Uh, so here we're using that VLT sphere data to reduce our um, Keras data. We get very similar results. Um, and so uh, this is broadly applicable then um, because nearly every disk uh, that is known has been observed in polarized intensity just because it's classically such a more effective technique. Um, similarly, uh, this gives it utility even for uh, observatories like JWST, which don't have polarimetry capabilities. Um, and then uh, along the lines of, say, the uh, ALICE program, which reobserved, or sorry, reprocessed a bunch of HST archival data, um, there's some really great opportunities for archival applications here. Um, and given the simplicity of the parameter space, this makes for really fast optimization. Um, and you know, in, in these examples here, this is running in, in minutes on a personal computer rather than uh, thousands of hours on a supercomputer. Um, and then uh, going forward, uh, for Roman CGI, uh, it should be plausible actually to um, perform PCRDI without any additional observing cost by leveraging uh, polarized and unpolarized standards to use as reference images. Um, so of course, depending on the details there, you might have to get a little bit creative, um, but it should at least uh, you know, be a very small investment um, at the worst to get a, a whole lot more data out of this. Um, and then on the MCRDI side, um, just really quickly uh, that we, um, actually, even in the case of more complex disks, as long as there's some subregion, since we can tune that optimization region, we only really need to uh, be able to approximate the disk with a simple model over some portion. So uh, even for um, more complex disks, we can enable detection of structures um, without having to explicitly include them in the model, which you would for conventional forward modeling. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I, I sort of mentioned this before, but it enables more accurate measurements than standard foreign modeling corrections. Uh, so in general use, I would consider this um, a, a no-brainer replacement. Um, and so to summarize, uh, using constrained RDI, um, we estimate the CSS to prevent signal loss. Um, and so PCRDI, we do this using PI, uh, and this lets us do a whole lot of analysis, even on, on complicated disks. And MCRDI, for roughly simple disks, we can just use fully synthetic models to achieve the same result. Um, this allows us to more effectively study uh, the youngest exoplanetary systems and helps us to answer some, some big uh, major questions in exoplanet science, uh, such as what are the viable and or dominant uh, planet formation channels in different contexts? Uh, and then uh, sort of more uh, zoomed in a bit, uh, how reliably actually do disk features indicate planets? How does the occurrence rate of, of planets uh, coincide with the uh, incidence of, of these features. Um, so going forward, I'll continue applying this um, to uh, similar contexts, probing for large separation planets and studying disk composition uh, through continued application to some upcoming uh, Keras data, uh, small survey that we're doing of young protoplanetary disks, um, and then through uh, application of MCRDI and PCRDI um, as, as we have uh, as is available to uh, upcoming JWST observations. Um, and then finally, in a few months, uh, I'm planning to release a, a GPU accelerated software to carry out these procedures um, by the uh, general public. Um, so with that, I'll leave up my information. And uh, thank you very much for your time. This is a picture of my dog um, shamelessly superimposed over a pretty JWST picture. Uh, so thank you. Awesome. Really, really interesting stuff, Kellen. Um, uh, please raise your hands. We'll probably have like five minutes or so, maybe a little longer to um, ask questions. Remember, Kellen's also here at Goddard, so definitely, if we're okay with it, Kellen, uh, bother him about, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, well, please do. Um, but uh, feel free to raise your hands. I have a couple of questions. I'll hold off until, um, unless we have some, uh, don't have any folks with their hands up yet. Uh, I'll go ahead and shoot then. Uh, so I guess I'll get to the question that I have. Um, that's maybe a more... A larger one. So you talk about PCRDI and MCRDI, and you talk about these in individual cases where, you, for example, you might have like, you know, the AV Riga, you might have an inclination kind of understood on something. So um, you can kind right. of focus on things. Have you thought about, you know, there's no reason you can't <clears throat> apply a range of synthetic models and then incorporate polarization, right? Um, 
So like a, a joint PC MCRDI where you can use a neural network across multiple types of this, and you can try to start to understand, you know, what types of fine structure might exist as a function of age or all these other things that might be cool kind of, you know, relationships. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think the key is that to, to get out a, a high throughput or nearly 100% throughput result with these techniques, uh, you don't actually have to go that far. Um, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, but I think all that stuff is a really interesting thing to do with the products once you get there. Once you have this high fidelity total and polarized intensity data, there's a ton of really interesting science that you can do. Um, you know, so I sort of alluded to this, but I didn't want to linger on it uh, for the sake of time. But that, um, you know, studying the dust composition, normally there's a pretty significant degeneracy if you're just using polarized or total intensity um, in terms of the uh, porosity of the dust, for instance. Um, you, uh, between porosity and say uh, the, the grain size distribution. Um, and so in principle, using multi-wavelength polarized and total intensity, you should absolutely be able to break some of those degeneracies um, and start looking at say, uh, you know, how the, um, the dust composition changes, uh, not just from system to system, but also spatially uh, within an individual system. Um, and so there's a lot of modeling that that would require, but uh, in principle, um, you know, we, we uh, can get products of high enough quality to do that sort of analysis uh, using these techniques. And obviously, I, I guess then for those types of parameters, as you get observations along a long time baseline, that's another parameter that you can kind of, you know, start to explore to kind of extricate these things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so sort of on the, um, the front of being able to better disentangle, you know, uh, what the occurrence rate of these planets is with respect to features, uh, one of the ways that you can do that with spiral arms is um, by tracking the motion of the velocity of the spiral arms over time, uh, you can determine uh, sort of what the likely driver is planet or, or simple, you know, gravitational instability unrelated to planets. Um, and so conventionally, this is really hard because over subtraction varies from you know, observation to observation, uh, and it makes it really difficult to get precise enough measurements to do this. Again, we're at really large separations here. So any motion is you know, to the tune of fractions of pixels. Um, and so uh, using products like this uh, gives us a, a window into making better measurements like that. Gotcha, super cool. Um, let's see, any questions otherwise? I have one other little one, so, um, and then the rest I'll, I'll bother you about later in person counting at some point. Uh, I see no other hands. Sure. So I do have a question on the ABA Riga, um, that image that you showed where you kind of have, and, and I know the paper that Dana has um, is super interesting. One of the things that I kind of want, wonder about is you see that kind of feature kind of align with where the planet is detected closer to the star. And, you know, are there artifacts that you would worry about that are like, all right, well, this might be a trailing arm or something like that. Uh, right. Well, so I, I think the biggest um, discriminator there is in terms of the, um, sorry, I know this isn't exactly the image that you were referring to, but it shows the same features. But um, uh, so I think the ability to, if it were just a trailing arm from the disk, um, we should expect at least that it's, uh, you know, comparable in terms of the, the spectrum and uh, that it has similar scattering properties. Um, and, you know, so I tried uh, also just considering uh, assuming that this was a localized difference of, of say, height um, for some unknown reason, uh, and you have to get to pretty extreme levels before you can reproduce the uh, the emission, well, would be emission signature there. Um, and so uh, it's, I kind of alluded to this, but that the spiral arms uh, sort of presence here, um, coinciding with the, the companion uh, is pretty much as, as expected based on simulations. Um, so uh, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of complicated nuance in, in Abiariga. Um, and it's hard to say, I think at this point, uh, what fraction of the weird stuff going on in uh, Abiariga's disk is, is uh, explicitly the result of, of this point source. Um, but uh, it, it at least seems uh, likely that there is something um, planet-like uh, at that position. Um, even considering, you know, uh, other factors. Gotcha. Very cool. Uh, let's see. I think we're I think we're down to three or four people. So uh, I think. Uh, um, sure. Thank you, again, Kellen. Um, but yeah. I will definitely be talking about all this cool stuff. And, you know, obviously, lots of applications for Roman and a bunch of other, you know, observations. So. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Um, and uh, 
thank you for uh, for hosting in the introduction and all that and look forward to talking with you more.